So uh, today what I want to talk about is I want to talk about mothers of faith. Mothers of faith. There's three women in the Bible that I want to talk about in Exodus this morning. Um, but um, before we do so, I want to look at some, some Mother Day quotes that I've uh, brought up that I like. And here, here are some. Um, I remember my mother's prayers, and they have always followed me. They have clung to me all my life. And this is a quote by Abraham Lincoln. All right? I remember my mother's prayers, and they've always followed me. And it's amazing because your, your prayers never die, right? They get stored up in bowls. So even if your parents have passed away, they're not here anymore. I believe the prayers are living on and they're driving you forward, okay? So prayers are so important. The next one here is only mothers can think of the future because they give birth to it in their children, right? So when you give birth to a child, you know you're giving birth to a future. Pretty awesome thought, okay? Next one is a man um, loves his sweetheart the most, his wife the best, but his mother the longest. Isn't that so true, right? And so God is so faithful to give us mothers, and um, we just want to honor them uh, today. There's one more here. The heart of a mother is a deep abyss at the bottom of which you will always find forgiveness. Another powerful quote. It's important to understand this, that mothers are called to be spiritual disciples of children yeah, you know, and it's not just the dad's job. Many times we think it was just the father's job, you know, to, to, to be the spiritual head of the home, and he's going to discipline the kids, and he's going he's gonna to read the Bible to the kids. You know, a father needs to take his place. Amen? But, uh, you know, in our home growing up, my father did, you know, read the Bible with us and stuff, but my mother was very strong. Uh, in, in, it was very much her doing and getting us together and doing devotions with us because my dad worked a lot. So she, you know, and I want to thank you for that, Mom, because you really, you, you, you got us to memorize the scripture. You got us to study the Bible. And so it was very, very important. In fact, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20 to 23 says, My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake the law of your mother. <laughs> All right? So Mama can have the law too, right? So don't forsake the law of your mother. It says here, Bind them continually upon your heart. Okay? Tie them around your neck. Next verse. And when you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. And when you awake, they will speak with you. So see, the, the, the commands of your mother. See, as mothers, you need to be speaking the word into your children. Teaching them the ways of the Lord. Because they will guide your children as they grow. Amen? That's what the scripture says. Today, I would like you to thank, in your hearts, have a thankfulness towards your mother because of the devotion that she had for you as a child. Amen? And even as an adult child, many times, there's a devotion there that you're not going to get from anyone else. It comes from mama, right? And, you know, even if we haven't had perfect moms and they've made their mistakes, at least we can thank them for giving birth to us or we wouldn't be here, right? So we can always find something to be thankful for with our moms. But today what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at a woman named Jochebed. Beautiful name, Jochebed. Uh, and, and this was her name. And uh, she's only mentioned twice in the Bible. First, in the, uh, Exodus 6.20, and in Numbers 26, verse 59. And she is actually responsible for preserving the life of God's chosen deliverer. And, uh, you know, I just want to give a little bit of credit to this woman, because if it wasn't for her... Who knows where we'd be today. So we're going to look at that together. In uh, Exodus chapter 1, Exodus chapter 1, verse 15. <coughs> I want to give you the just the overview of what's happening here. You know that Joseph went to Egypt and he began to have children, and he brought his father and his family, he brought Israel into Egypt, and they, they, they lived in Egypt, and they were prospering in Egypt, and he had great favor with the king, but then there was another king that came along who did not know Joseph, and he didn't show favor to Joseph, so the children of Israel were going into bondage and into captivity over this period of time. In Exodus chapter, um, I'm going to start in... Um, Verse 15, 
And so the king wanted to, so what the king wanted to do is he wanted to deal with this issue of overpopulation because he was afraid that the the children of Israel would become too powerful and would overthrow Egypt. So the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the names of one was Sebara and the other name was Pua. That's how I pronounce them anyway. So two midwives, say two midwives. Two midwives. So there was two. I don't know how many more there were, but there was two that are mentioned here in the Bible. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on their birth stool, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. <laughs> but if it's a daughter, you shall let him live. This is, this is pretty traumatic, actually. I want you to be, you know, the king gets these two women together. Okay, so you guys are like the chief midwives of Israel. I want you to to be the executioner of any male child that comes out of the womb. Now, that's a pretty traumatic thing for a midwife because if you know midwives, they have a passion from God to care for babies, right? And they're being told by the king, I mean, so they're probably thinking, why don't you do your own dirty work? Why, why are you putting this on our table? But anyway, here they are. They have this responsibility um, that they have to do. And it says, verse 17, but the midwives... Feared God. See, see that word feared? And did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. They feared God. And um, I, want, I just want to touch this here for a second. The word feared actually means yarei. Yarei means to stand in awe of something or someone possessing great power, to revere someone. It actually means to be afraid. And, and it says here that they, these women, they feared God. They stood in awe of God's power. And the fear of God is, is, first of all, not a terror that he's against us or that he'll strike us without cause or warning. Rather, the fear of the Lord produces wise, healthy actions. And so if you truly fear God, you stand in awe of his word. And when you read it, you say, I, I, I don't care what the, the world system tells me I have to do. I don't care what my friends and peers say I should do. I'm going to obey God because he's God and I'm not. Amen. And ultimately, he holds my soul in his hands. And, and there's so little of the fear of God in the house of God today, and not specifically this church, but in, in general, people don't fear God. There's no, there's no reverence for God in the house of God. Not very much of it anymore. Amen? But how many know that a healthy fear of God is, is, is a good thing? Say, it's a good thing. Good thing. All right? And so, so, so let's look at this together. See, the midwives were more afraid of angering God by destroying innocent babies than they were afraid of disobeying, disobeying the Pharaoh who was saying, I want you to do this against your conscience. And so what I believe is the church, we, we're entering a time, if, if we're not there now, we're going there, where we're going to have to learn to stand for truth and say, I don't give a rip of what Pharaoh or what the political system says is politically correct. I'm going to obey God. And if it costs my life, it costs me my life. Because I'm not going to compromise. Amen? So here you got two women who, who decide, listen, we fear God. We're going to hide babies. We're not going to kill babies. That's a beautiful thing. Amen. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 6 says this. Unfailing love and faithfulness make atonement for sin. See, God unconditionally loves us. And because He unconditionally loves us, He forgives us and He atones. Our sin is, our sin is taken care of by the cross. Say, His mercy and truth atone for my sins. That's what took place. But the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. If you don't, if you don't, and that word fear, to stand in awe and reverence of God. You know, we talked about Georgia. One of the things those people, they, they fear God. They, they get in the Word and they study the Word line upon line, verse upon verse, that they might walk in truth. And you know what the benefit of that is? Health and healing. Amen. In all areas. But we have to come back to that place of reverence. The fearing of the Lord, people avoid evil. When you, you know, when you've been washed by the blood and you've been sanctified and set free from sin, why would you go back into that? There has to be almost like, I, I just, I, I respect, I honor God so much, I'm not going to go back into that. I don't want to do anything that will affect this feeling of God's presence in my life. Amen? It's one thing to know the love of God, but it's also important to fear 
or stand in reverent, reverential awe of God. I want to look at just a couple verses about the fear of God this morning. Psalm 31, verse 9. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eyes waste away with grief, yes, my soul and my body. Now, um, did I give you the right verse? Okay, go to Psalm 128, verse 1 to 4. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Next verse. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Next verse. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very vine heart of your house, your children like olive plants all around your table. Verse 4. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. You want to be blessed, you have to have reverence for God. To fear God says, I'm, I'm not going to obey man. I'm not going to obey compromise. I'm going to obey God. That's what the fear of the Lord is. Proverbs 19.23. Let's look at another one here. The fear of the Lord leads to life, and he who has it will abide in satisfaction. You want to have satisfaction in your life? You need to fear God. He will not be visited with evil. People who fear God, the Bible says, you're not going to be visited with evil. All right? That's, that's a pretty good promise, isn't it? Let's look at another one. Proverbs 22, 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. If you want riches, if you want honor, if you want life, you need humility and the fear of the Lord. And so it's important to understand that there's a place in our life for the reverential fear of God. And if the enemy could do anything, he'd want the church to just focus on the love of God and never talk about reverence for God. You know, that's legalism. You don't want to talk about the fear of God. That's legalism. Because the devil wants you not to have riches, honor, and life. The devil wants you to live not in satisfaction, but in depression. I'm telling you, there's something with the fear of God, the reverence of God, that causes you to stand before man and say, I don't give a rip. This is what I believe. And it feels good. Amen? Amen? Instead of tiptoeing through the tulips and trying not to offend anybody, you can stand up for truth and do it in love with a heart of compassion, but you're driven and gripped by reverence for God. It's a powerful thing and only can be done by the Holy Ghost. Let's go to the next one. Psalm 33, verse 18 to 19. Behold, the, the eyes of the Lord uh, is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy. To deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. God is going to deliver your soul from death. He's going to keep you alive when everyone else is in famine, when they're spiritually starving and saying, I don't know where the presence of God. You're going to say, hey, I'm filled with the presence of God. I'm filled. I, I have abundance. Why? Because I fear God. I stand in reverence for my God. And when the rest of the church wants to compromise, uh, other Christians want to do this or do that and say, well, you know, you're too legalistic. And you say, no, I fear God. I walk in reverence for God. And I have a standard for my life. Amen? God is good. Let's go to the next one here. Psalm 34, 7. The angel of the Lord encamps around all those who fear him and delivers them. I, you know, I want the angels of God to camp around my house. Right? Um, I want the angels of God to camp around my life. How many about you? To know that you're safe. Why? Because you have reverence for God. You, you stand in awe of God. He's not just your sugar daddy that you go to when you need, you know, live life how you want. But then when you get in trials and tribulations, you start calling up to God. No, God wants you to walk with him in reverence. Psalm, where are we now? I'm just giving you a bunch of them. Psalm 145, verse 19. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and save them. Again, the fear of God. How many think the fear of God is important? Yeah. I can't hear you. How many think it's important? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's do one more. There's many, many more. I just wanted to whet your appetite. Psalm 34, verse 9. It says, Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. I'm here to tell you that there's something about having reverence for God that is going to help you to walk in victory in life. And it's not a fear. Again, it's not a fear. You're not supposed to be afraid of God, but you have to be aware that, hey, listen, God is more important than everything else. All right? 
Well, Pastor, I think that the fear of the Lord is Old Testament. Well, let's look at the let's look at the New Testament here for a minute. Acts chapter nine, verse thirty one. We'll read it together. Then let's read it together. Then the churches throughout all Judah, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. All right? And so you see here something that's very beautiful that only God can do is that he, the fear of God, the reverence of God, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit work together. And when you have that, guess what happens? The church multiplies. Right? Because you have the fear of the Lord. Here's a quote here that I want to bring up by Oswald Chambers. Let me just bring it up here. It says, the remarkable thing about God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. So there needs to be that reverential fear of God has to be um, in your life. So let's read on in our story back in Exodus chapter 1. Now we're in verse 18. So the midwives feared God more than they feared the Pharaoh. And you've got to realize in those days, if you did not obey the king, you, your husband, all your possessions were burnt. You were killed without even a question. But they said, we don't care about our own life. We fear God. We're not going to take the life of innocent children. We're going we're to protect the children. Let's look at what happens in verse 18. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? Pretty good question. Verse 19, And the midwife said to the Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively, and they give birth before the midwives come to them. In other words, they lied. That's a load of crap. They, that wasn't the case. They, they literally were helping, and they lied to the king. Now look what happens here. All right? Um, I'm losing my notes here. Where was I here? Okay, so they're keeping the kids alive. So the midwife said to the Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth. So basically they lied to the Pharaoh. Okay? Um, so I want, I, want, I want you to see what happens to the midwives here. In Exodus chapter 1, verse 20. Therefore, God dealt with the midwives. Okay? He dealt evil with the midwives. Is that what it says? No. He dealt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and grew very mighty. If you fear God over man, if you have a reverence and an awe for God, God will deal well with you. Just like all the verses we just read about the fear of God, we see here that he dealt well with the midwives. And verse 21, And so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. I'm sorry, but I was on YouTube the other night watching a pastor after pastor that I used to really respect, uh, listening to how they're dropping their vows. Said, "Well, you know, it's okay. You can be gay and not repent and come to church, and you can do. You can, you know, you can have this issue, or it's okay to do." And they're compromising because they don't fear God anymore. All I care about is what God says is truth. Amen? And it was because the midwives feared God and said, I'm not going to come under political correctness and obey what they're saying to do. I'm going to fear God and obey God. He provided households for them, which means he gave them children, so they became mothers. Isn't that awesome? And so these two women now are mothers. God has blessed them. God has shown favor to them because they feared God. So Pharaoh commanded all the people, saying, Now, this is the second command. The midwives wouldn't listen. So now he said to all the people, say all the people, every son who is born of you will be cast into the river and every daughter you will remain alive or will save alive. This was the next commandment. But then there's a man in the house of Levi went and took a wife, a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son and when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. Now this woman now is the mother of Moses. And so everybody else was having kids and then they were, their baby was taken from them or they would have to destroy their baby if it was a male child. But she saw that the baby was beautiful. 
It was precious. It was from God. And she, had, she, she hid the child. Look what happens here. She hid the child for three months, but when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, dabbed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the riverbed. All right? She hid him for three months. Say three months. But when she couldn't hide him anymore, she, she put him in an ark and put him in the river. See, this, this woman was a woman of faith. And I think it's important because she was mentioned in the great hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And I think that's important. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. It says here, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents. The father gets some credit here too. Because they saw that he was a beautiful child. And they were not afraid of the king's command. Right? So faith is the opposite of fear. So everyone else was afraid. So they would obey the king and they would abort what was given to them. They would abort what they gave birth to. They would abort the blessing that they received from God. But she did not fear the king's command. She feared God and she hid her blessing. She hid her child away for three months. And when she got to a place where she couldn't hide him anymore because maybe the neighbors were hearing about it or he would cry at night or something. She, I can't hide this child. Somebody's going to find out. i got to do something. What does she do? She builds an ark. You know, an ark really represents Jesus. And she takes the child and she puts him in the ark and she puts him in the water. So, you know, when God has birthed something in you, when you, God wants you to give birth to something. That's going to deliver you and deliver a nation. And if, you, if you're willing to allow the enemy to come and, and cause you to feel pressure to compromise your conviction because everybody else is doing this. If you allow that to happen, you, you, you will abort the, the, the thing that God wants to birth through you. Whatever God births through you, whatever vision, whatever prophetic word he gave you, whatever, whatever it might even be your natural children, you've got to take this and you have to hide it in your heart. Like the little one, the one who went out, the kingdom of God is like a man who finds a treasure and hides it. You have to hide that which is precious to you. This is what this woman did. And when she could hide it no longer, she put it in an ark. And she said, I'm releasing this to you, Jesus. I'm going to obey the king. I'm going to throw my child in the river, but I'm putting him in a boat first because I trust you. Amen. And there comes a time when you have to say, okay, I'm going to take whatever this promise is that the enemy's been trying to steal from me, whatever God's trying to birth through you. Don't compromise. Say, I'm going to build, I'm going to hide it in my heart. And if I have to, I'll release it to the Lord and trust him, but I'm not going to abort the plan of God for my life. Amen? This is making sense to anybody? You know, the personal effort and the work of her hands um, was proof of her faith in the endeavor. Faith will move us to utilize the resources, the gifts, and the abilities given to us by God to do something to bring forth the blessing. In James chapter 2, verse 17 to 18 says, Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It has to have works. Something has to, you have to do something in order to um, make this thing work. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. And so this is beautiful because this woman, she didn't just pray, God, save my child. How many, you know, we can get in a place in our lives like, God, just save me or save my kids. Or save, save the vision that you gave me. Save it, God. I want you to take care of it. She didn't cry out and just say, God, save it. She had a plan. She executed the plan. She tricked the Pharaoh. And she, and, and she, you have to have a plan. You have to work at establishing that which God has given you. The decision to put Moses in the water was total affirmation of her confidence in God. Can we follow such an example? Can we place the most valuable thing to us into his care and say, Lord, I'm going to trust you with this? That's what God is after. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, it says, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, 
I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep what I commit to him until that day. Paul was convinced that he could, that God would keep whatever he committed to him. Whatever you commit to God, he can keep it. Amen? Exodus chapter 2, verse 3. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes, dabbed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the riverbank. Now, let's see what happens in Exodus chapter 2, verse 4 to 6. I love this. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Now, I, I have a feeling that, I had a feeling that, see, this woman was a smart woman. And I had a feeling she, she, she probably realized that the princess would come down to this certain place and she would bathe in the river. So she probably had a strategy. She probably thought, okay, I'm going to put the baby in the reeds close to where the, the, you know, the, the princess comes to bathe because maybe there's a chance that, you know, I, I think she was thinking, how many would agree? I don't think it was just kind of like, let's just throw the baby anywhere. I think she had a plan. And so this is what happens. And so the sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the river. And her maidens walked along the riverbed. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So that she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew children. All right. And then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. And the Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. For her, you know this. This is really, really cool because let's look at what's happening. The Pharaoh wants to kill off any possible deliverer for the people of God. The enemy said, "You know what? I don't want to deliver to raise up from the children of Israel, so we'll kill all the male children." So the plan was, let's destroy the babies, all the boys. <coughs> Number two, Jochebed hides her precious son for three months, realizes I can't hide him anymore. Number three, she gets her baby back, okay? And the Pharaoh who is trying to kill the deliverer is now paying the birth mother to raise the child. <laughs> Think about that. Isn't that how, how the enemy was? I'm going to destroy their life. I'm going to destroy their life. So the Pharaoh is like, I'm going to kill all the kids. And then he ends up funding the growth of a child he's trying to destroy. See, the enemy will not win if you place your blessing, if you take what God is birthing in you and put it on the waters and trust God. Amen? Amen. The enemy will end up paying for trying to destroy you. <clears throat> your enemy wants to steal and kill and destroy what God is birthing in you. You see the beauty of the gift, and you'll hide it away in your heart. You're going to put that precious gift in an ark. You're going to put it into Jesus. Say, Lord, I trust you with this thing. And your enemy will pay for trying to mess with your blessing. That's right. And I find this amazing because, if, you know, the Pharaoh's like, I'm going to kill the deliverer. I'm going to kill any chance of a deliverer. So the deliverer ends up being paid for. By him to be raised and then ends up in his house as one of his adopted sons. That's messed up. <laughs> See, God will win every time if we put our faith in him. And the key is we have to be like these women. There's three women here who feared God before they feared man. I'm not just gonna abort, I'm not just gonna throw away, I'm not just gonna throw away. That, that inheritance that God has given me because I want to be politically correct or I want to keep people happy. No, I'm going to hold fast to that thing. I'm going to hold it. I'm going to trust God. And in doing so, God will bless you. Amen? And God will raise you up. Father, I thank you, Lord, this morning that you're raising up your people to have a heart of conviction. And to obey you, God, and to fear you in a healthy way, to stand in reverence of your word and to live by it and allow it to transform us. Father, that we would not just compromise or give up that which you want to birth in us, 
but that we trust it to you, God, that we'd hide it in our hearts. And in doing so, Father, the blessing of the Lord will come. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Isn't God good? All right. Isn't God good? You know, the amazing thing is if she would have, if she would have feared man instead of God, she would have aborted her child. And because she feared God, she was delivered herself. She was delivered by her own son. And that day she was delivered because she feared God. And you don't know how your actions will affect your future. Amen? If you choose to fear the Lord.